and I'm going to show you a few techniques for controlling the lighting. Uh, we'll work with ground reflections a little bit. We're going to look at some camera techniques, and we're going to talk about how this is actually done when you're doing real jewelry photography so that you can uh, as closely uh, simulate that inside the software as you can. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about rendering, uh, everything from render settings to 32-bit output and how that's beneficial. And we'll go into masks, uh, which will set us up for our last uh, phase of this webinar, uh, which we'll, we'll be doing a little bit of finalizing in Photoshop. And I'm going to show you how you can pull out details in, say, these areas that are really blown out where we kind of lose uh, the detail in our render. So without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get rolling here. And I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and take some, some breaks here and there throughout the webinar and give you all an opportunity to ask questions. And we'll certainly have a question and answer period at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and get Keyshot started here. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and import a model. And this is a Rhino file. So we'll go ahead and bring that in. Okay. And what we need to do here is go ahead and start assigning materials. Now, one thing I want to show you with this particular model, and this is a, a general uh, key shot thing. It's not specific to jewelry. I pull up my materials here, and I'm going to go to precious metals. And inside of our precious metals, we already have some preset for you. Everything from gold 24K down to gold 10K, and rose gold 18K, 14K, uh, platinum, and a silver. Um, so for this, I'll just go ahead and grab silver, and I'll drop it on there. And I want you guys to notice, look what happened here. Uh, we don't have uh, the materials all broken out. It applied silver to everything on the ring here. So uh, being that this is a Rhino file, all the hierarchy in the CAD application is retained. And you can see here in the Materials tab that Silver 1 is applied to every single material. So what I can do, though, is I can select the top item in the list, press Shift, left click, select everything in the scene tree, and if I right click and say Unlink Part, that's going to separate all of those. So now what I can do is go ahead and uh, assign materials that are to all the different gemstones. So I'll switch this from Precious Metals over to Gemstones. And let's go ahead and drag and drop a diamond onto the, uh, the large stone there. Okay. And after we've done that, what I would like to do next is go ahead and pull up the properties of this diamond material so I can explain to you uh, what all this means. Okay. So the first property in the list is IOR, and that stands for index of refraction. Now, every... Uh, material in the world, from gemstones to metals, has an index of refraction. And basically what it refers to is the amount that light is slowed down as it hits an object. And that changes the way that light behaves. Now a diamond has an index of refraction of around 2.4. So if you type that in here, you can precisely uh, calculate what how a diamond would refract light. And the great thing is, uh, things of this nature are readily available online. So if I type in diamond index of refraction, I can find that, 2.4.175. And you can do that for pretty much any gemstone and find what you're looking for. Okay. Um, now, these other properties here, uh, transparency and roughness, uh, transparency is basically going to be how clear the diamond is, so how much light actually penetrates it as it, uh, as it passes through it. Roughness probably won't apply to any of you doing uh, jewelry and want highly polished gemstones, so I'd leave that alone. Um, the next thing you really want to take a look at, though, here is this Abbey number. And uh, what this Abbey number is, it's another physical property for how much a gemstone is capable of dispersing light. Or in other words, how, how much does it actually separate the light into the um, varying colors of the spectrum and that's what gives you your color in the diamond. Okay, So let me go ahead and drop this down a bit. By the way, uh, the Abbey number for a diamond is 55, and it's preset that way in Keyshot already, so you already do have an accurate uh, amount of dispersion for a diamond. I'm actually going to increase my ray bounces as well so we get more light bouncing around in here. 
And the one thing you can do, I mean, sure, 55 is the most accurate representation of a diamond, but what if you would like to push that effect a little further and get more color in your diamond? What you can do is you can start to drop this number. The lower you go, the more color you get, and you can start to see that in here. We're getting a little bit more of that dispersion happening. Now, the most color that you'll be able to get out of Keyshot is essentially going to be around 0 .001. As soon as you go to zero, the Abbey number goes away, and it's no longer dispersing light. Okay, So that's something that's good to know. I mean, you might want a perfectly accurate rendering of a diamond, or you might want to actually you know, do what you can to try and get some more color out of it. So that's how you can achieve that. Uh, the other thing I did want to point out, and, and I already uh, went over to the real time and adjusted this, is this ray bounce setting. When you are rendering complex, transparent objects like gemstones, diamonds, things of that nature, you will need to turn these up uh, for your final render. While you're working, you can probably keep them at a value of around 6 or so. But when it's time for your final render, you'll want to crank this. And what this means is essentially how many times is this light uh, bounced around inside the diamond. You know, when it hits one facet on the inside and bounces around to another and continues uh, its, its path around the inside of that gemstone. And the great thing is, since Keyshot's so interactive, you can just adjust this slider in the real-time tab. And when you don't see any visual improvement on your diamond, uh, you know that you really don't need any more ray bounces. But again, while you're working, you can probably keep it down to a value of around 6 or 8. Okay, so what I'll go ahead and do now is copy this diamond material and paste it to the other gemstones. So I'll do that by pressing shift left click on the diamond and shift right click to paste. And we'll move around this ring very quickly and get it all, uh, all the materials assigned. And one thing you can do actually if you, if you have named all the parts in your model and you know what's what, you could essentially select all the uh, diamonds in there, right click and say link parts, and that would link all the diamonds, so you would really only have to assign it once. But in this case, I'll just go ahead and keep them separate. And it's still very fast to be able to do. Okay, so we've already got some uh, material set up on here and already that's that's looking pretty good and that didn't take a whole lot of effort okay. and what I'll go ahead and do now is we'll uh, work on a little bit of the lighting and what I want to do is I want to actually position this so that it's laying on its side so it's resting on the ground so I'll go ahead and right click and select move object and I'll start to rotate it and I want to position it so that it's actually sitting flat on the ground now, Keyshot will automatically snap in uh, varying increments of degrees. And I already know, uh, since I have worked with this model already, that for my rotation on X, I want negative 10.5. So I can type that in, and that will uh, give me the right uh, amount of rotation to actually let this lay flat on the ground. Okay. Now, uh, another uh, thing I would like to talk about under the real-time tab here are a couple settings, detailed indirect illumination and ground indirect illumination. This essentially allows realistic uh, bouncing of light around your scene. So in other words, if you had, say, a red ball on top of a white plane, light would hit that red ball and you would get some color bleeding onto that white plane. You would see red light actually scattered down onto the plane. So when you turn on detailed indirect illumination, this will allow light to essentially bounce in and around geometry. It's also good for when you have transparent objects on top of uh, other geometry. If you want light to actually penetrate transparent objects and illuminate geometry beneath them, uh, you'll want to turn this on. Uh, this is purely a real-time setting, so if you actually go to the render menu and press render, it's always turned on because it is the most accurate way. Uh, we give you this option in the real-time tab because it does help with performance while you're working and setting things up. The other thing is, is ground indirect illumination. And it's the same exact thing, except it is um, occurring only on this ground plane where we get our shadows uh, 
cast. So if I turn this on, you'll see immediately uh, this bouncing of light that occurs. Okay, see now we are getting light uh, reflected down underneath there. Okay, so the main difference between these two is this one occurs light bouncing on the ground plane and detailed indirect illumination uh, affects light bouncing within geometry. Okay. All right, now when you are rendering jewelry, nine times out of ten, you're probably going to want to go with uh, some of the studio lighting environments. They might not always uh, give you exactly what you're looking for, but I'll show you some ways that you can go ahead and you know, work on customizing those and get light a little more finely tuned for what you're looking for. Uh, we'll go ahead and switch one out real quick. And for those of you who don't know, you can control brightness of the environment using up and down arrows. That adjusts it in, in large increments. Left and right is finer increments. And you can also control environment rotation by pressing control, left clicking and dragging, and rotating your environment. And that's going to change how the reflections actually fall across your model, which is really nice, especially since, again, the look of jewelry is in, almost entirely defined by the environment that it's in. So reflections are incredibly important. Another thing I want to show you here is under the environment tab, you can actually adjust the environment height. And let's take a look at what that does. This shifts the environment up and down. And again, it's another way that you can actually control reflections and how they fall across your model. Okay. Now, for those of you who, are, uh, who would like to you know, create your own studio environments, I suggest taking a look at HDR Light Studio. Uh, they do allow you to actually create your own custom HDRIs. And uh, that might help you out, especially because you know, most everyone is going to use these default stock ones. But if you can create your own, it might make your renders stand out a little bit more. Although if you don't feel like purchasing that, you will be able to certainly get some nice lighting with the uh, environments that we provide. Now the other thing I want to talk about is gamma. And the reason I want to talk about this is Again, with jewelry, I mean, look at these bright areas here. We're kind of losing a lot of detail because they're really blown out. We have a lot of contrast in this image. Now, to, one way to fix that, and what I do suggest doing if you are rendering jewelry, and, and a lot of other things for that, for that matter, is going under the real-time tab and adjusting this gamma property from 1.2 to somewhere up around anywhere between 1.8 and 2.2. 2.2 is going to be the most accurate in terms of how light falls off, 1.8 is going to allow you to get a little bit more contrast in your image. So I suggest staying within that range, and um, you know it will it will certainly improve the look of your renders and their dynamic range. Okay. So let's look at something else we can do to actually control uh, the lighting and reflections. I'll go ahead and import another piece of geometry here. And I'll just go ahead and get this bounce plane. And when you are importing another piece of geometry, you have a couple options. Uh, Keyshot already knows that there is a model in the scene. Um, so you have the option here to add to scene. If I uncheck this, it would replace my current scene with the model that I'm importing. Um, you also have center geometry, snap to ground, which will put it in the center of the scene, and uh, your coordinate system. Uh, these were created in two different CAD packages, so I'm just going to uh, use automatic. And that puts my plane right in there for me. And I'll go ahead and right click on this and select move object. And we'll lift it up above the ring here. And I'll go ahead and scale this up a bit. And what I can do is change the color. So if I want some more black in the ring, anything along those lines, I could do that. And if you use the emissive material, what you can do is you can actually hide this plane from view, but still keep it visible in reflections. So I'll change this from advanced over to emissive. Okay, It is emitting light right now. I can turn that intensity down to zero, and it won't emit light. But you can see it still is reflecting there in the ring. Okay. Now what I can do is turn off this visible to eye. 
under the emissive. And I do know that it's still right here. So if I right click and select move object, I can still position this plane and have it actually influence this ring and uh, create some, some uh, interesting new reflections. The other thing you can do is actually map uh, textures to these emissive planes. And I'll just create a very simple one, uh, very quick, and show you uh, what level of control that will give you. This won't be anything uh, too complex, so it's really easy technique here. I'm just going to essentially create a square here that's half black and half white. And we'll save this out as a texture. And we'll call this emissive texture. Okay, now back into Keyshot. What I can do, I will bring my emissive plane back so you can see it. And I'll go ahead and load in that texture. I will actually need to turn up the intensity on that for it to be visible, but it, you don't need much. I'll do a value of around one. Now what's really nice about this is now we get some, some light there in the reflections. And what you can do is I can continue to scale this. And if I wanted to, I could repeat that texture uh, by adjusting the scale of it. and start to create um, an entirely new look for my reflections. And again, I can uh, hide that material. So if I go over here and uncheck visible to eye, it's no longer there. And you can still continue to actually move uh, this, this plane here and position your reflections. And you can have as many of these planes set up as you would like. Uh, they can be small planes that maybe accentuate uh, little areas on the model or they can be larger and uh, positioned up above your environment to give you some uh, larger overall reflections. Okay. Now, uh, another thing I want to show you, I, I do have another scene uh, that I set up beforehand on this webinar. Um, just getting back to the whole concept that, you know, um, your environment is going to define the look of your geometry. Let me pull this up here. And this was essentially the environment that I used for the, uh, the slide that showed the uh, topics that we we're going to cover. And let's look at an example image that essentially inspired me to, to create this one. Look here. So this, this really does create an interesting mood. Again, like I was saying, if maybe you're doing a, a Valentine's Day collection or a spring collection and you would like to incorporate some of that color into your render, uh, this was actually really easy to pull off. Um, all I did was have an abstract piece of geometry. Uh, it's nothing special. didn't take a whole lot of time to create. And then just positioned it in the environment. Uh, there's a couple of them in here, actually, um, on either side. And you can, you can move that around and position it and uh, really create some interesting, uh, unique looks. I mean, even just a little splash of color. Uh, might add a bit of uh, visual interest to your to your jewelry rendering. Um, I can select that material and maybe you know if I'm doing like a spring collection or something like that, I would want a green or a yellow. So it's a uh, very customizable and it's it's subtle, but uh, in a lot of cases you know subtlety is is, is real nice. Okay. So let's go back to uh, this other scene that I had set up and let's talk a little bit about ground reflections and how we can control those. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at uh, the easiest way of doing ground reflections in Keyshot. If I pull up my options box and I go to environment, I can turn on ground reflections. Okay. There it is. Puts a very simple uh, ground reflection in there. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is they are going to be uh, more more pronounced when you have a say a dark environment or a dark background color. If I hide the environment, 
and say only have white as my background color, it's, it's not as sharp, it's not as apparent. Uh, but if I change my background color to something darker, you do get a, a more uh, pronounced gr ground reflection. So that's the easiest way of going about ground reflections. But what if you wanted a little bit more control? Say something like uh, this example right here. Uh, how would you go about that? Well, let's, uh, let's do that. It's actually still pretty easy. I'll go ahead and turn off uh, ground reflections, and I'll bring my environment back so I can see what's going on in here. And let's go ahead and import a ground plane. So, into the import, I'll go ahead and click Add to Scene, and I'd like the coordinates to be automatic. Okay, so what I need to do now is move the object and position it so it's right below the ring. So I'll rotate it, I'll click Snap to Ground, and I'll go ahead and push this Scale button so that I can increase the size of this ground plane. All right, this gives us a lot more flexibility and control over how our ground reflection is going to look. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that uh, the shadows uh, cast on here will take a little bit longer uh, because it is being cast across geometry. It is a different method than the way that the ground shadows are calculated on the ground plane. Uh, the ground plane has a very efficient way of doing it. So if you, um, if you can use the ground plane uh, for whatever you're doing, I suggest uh, doing that because your shadows will calculate faster. But if you need more control over your ground reflections, uh, I suggest importing a, a piece of geometry uh, like we've done here and going that route. Okay, so first thing we can do, um, I'd like to show you the advanced material. So if I double click on this and pull up the properties, uh, this gives us a, a lot of interesting uh, tools to work with for, for creating the look of our ground reflection. And the first thing you need to do to actually get this ground plane reflecting something is go over here to the specular and change this color from black up to white. That's going to give you the most reflectivity that this uh, ground plane is capable of producing. There's another property that does come into play to increase this. Uh, but I do suggest increasing the specular all the way to white and then using this other property down here to control the intensity of your reflections. Um, another thing I do want to point out, you see back here how we have this sort of clipped area, this sharp edge? Let me show you why that is. If we zoom out here, what we've got going on is our environment is actually uh, intersecting the ground plane. So there's our environment sphere right there and the ground plane is intersecting it. So what you can do is go into the environment tab, increase the size, which will increase the size of that dome. And now when we zoom back in to our ring here, that edge will be pushed further out and it might not be as apparent. Okay, so maybe we want this reflection to be even more pronounced right here on this property, IOR, as you increase this, things will become more reflective. So I can go up to a value of around 3 or maybe 4. And, you know, we're getting a much uh, sharper reflection happening here. And remember what I said earlier, too, about um, you know, reflections will be more apparent on darker uh, background environments or background colors. Same thing with when you're using geometry. If I bring this diffuse color down to black, that's going to give me uh, my sharpest reflection. Okay. Now it is uh, a very perfect uh, reflection. What if you wanted to add a bit of distress to this, uh, maybe make it not so perfect? What you can do is you can start to increase this roughness. Okay. So that starts to break that up a little bit. And it's similar to what we have going on here in this uh, example photo that I was able to find online. Now, one thing to take into account when you are adding roughness to, uh, to your materials is this glossy samples property. This essentially controls the accuracy of uh, rendering rough materials. And as you increase it, uh, your rendered result will be more accurate, uh, but it does take more processing power. So it's something you want to use you know, 
with, with a level of control. Only apply it where you need it. Uh, it does only come into play uh, when you have rough materials. So although I could set some glossy samples on this perfectly polished ring, I would not want to do so because it will uh, give me no added gain whatsoever. If you don't see glossy samples in your material parameters, you'll want to go up to Edit, Preferences, and make sure that Show Advanced Settings is enabled. Okay, so if we zoom in here and take a look, I can continue to increase this roughness. So maybe I have something that's uh, not very polished at all, but has only a slight level of reflection. And as you can see, using this method definitely gives you a bit more control over uh, the look of your ground reflections. And you can use any of the, the key shot materials. If I wanted to put an orange paint under there, I don't know why I would want to do that, but <laughs> if I wanted to, I have that option. Or a silver pearl. Uh, the other uh, probably common material type to use would be one of the metals. Um, you could use essentially a diamond plate. Probably wouldn't want to, to do that for jewelry. or one of the other ones with textures. And if I double click on that ground plane and pull up the properties of this texture, I can actually go to this bump map tab and scale this down. Let me do a different projection method on here. And you can use different bump maps to create um, different interesting looks. You can adjust height. So if you want something that's a little more subtle, uh, you can do that. And you can type in a value so that you get something very, very subtle. And again, you know, this is going to be a lot more interesting uh, than just, say, your perfect ground reflection. Especially, you know, it might make your render stand out a little bit more than somebody who just, uh, you know, throws on the key shot standard ground reflection although that certainly could work for you. Now the other thing you can do in conjunction with bump maps is uh, use roughness. So we do have this subtle wave going on in this metal material, but I can also add a bit of roughness to it so that it adds these microscopic levels of imperfections uh, to that surface. I'll go ahead and remove this bump map. And the next thing I'd like to talk to you guys about is uh, camera techniques uh, when, when uh, rendering jewelry. Now, most of the time when people photograph jewelry in the real world, they're not going to position their camera right up next to the ring or the necklace or whatever piece of jewelry they're rendering and take a photo that way. Uh, just the physics of lenses don't work that way. It would be very hard to focus all this. and uh, capture a large amount of detail. So what you want to do when you are rendering jewelry is pull your camera way back. So you want, and this is the way it's, it's really done. Um, pull your camera back and then under our camera tab in the options menu, go over to camera and what you want to do here is adjust this focal length. Now this right here is already by default set to a 35 millimeter lens. So that's a, a decent mid-range lens that you would use uh, you know, in just everyday photography. Most point-and-shoot cameras would have uh, a similar focal length. Now, as you increase this number, what you start to get is a zoom lens. So this will be more like your telephoto lens. So we pull our camera back and we start to increase this. You can increase it by using a slider. And you can also do it by holding Alt and using the middle mouse wheel back. So we can get anything from, say, like a 200 to a 300 millimeter lens and really zoom in on this. Now the other thing that that's going to do for you is remember that uh, ground plane clipping in the back? You're going to have a lot more range of motion around this ring without end up actually seeing that ground plane back there. So it's a nice way to also uh, not have to deal with that problem. 
Okay. And the other interesting thing about this is when you do pull your camera back and you zoom in on the ring, it does change the way that depth of field behaves than if you actually had the camera uh, positioned right up on the model. Um, now, for those of you who aren't sure what depth of field is, uh, I guarantee you you've seen it before. You just uh, might not be familiar with the terminology. And I'll go ahead and show you uh, what that is. So let's zoom in here. And under the camera tab, you have this option. And it's if I click to enable depth of field, uh, you see my screen went all haywire and I, I can't see what's going on. The reason is, uh, is my focus distance. If I click this pick focus, and I remember the ring is right around in this area. That means now that my camera lens is focused right here on this diamond since I clicked uh, right there. Now if I want to increase that effect of you know, a camera focusing on a set spot, I can lower this f-stop. So that's going to increase the amount of blur. So I'll do an extreme amount so you can see uh, very quickly uh, what that does. So I'll pick my focus. We'll focus right there on the top of the gemstone. And that shifts it. Uh, as soon as you're happy with your focus point, you can press done. Now, uh, most of the time, you know, in uh, doing research and, and looking at jewelry photography, uh, a lot of photographers choose to have very subtle or almost no depth of field at all. Uh, you know, I guess most of the time, you would want uh, the whole piece of jewelry to be in focus so that uh, the person who's interested in buying it can, can see it. But in some cases, a nice subtle amount back here is not all a bad thing. And the other place that you can use this, not just uh, in, in blurring out where the, uh, where the ring is, but also if you choose to have uh, these additional shapes and objects in your scene to uh, create the additional reflections on your jewelry, if you have depth of field turned on, it uh, certainly creates an interesting look out of those. You don't have that sharp um, you know, edge where that, that piece is. You know, and it becomes just this, this abstract shape back there that, that can add to your scene. So that's another uh, useful way that you can use depth of field. So I think the most important thing for you guys to take from this, this portion uh, when using your camera techniques to render jewelry is really pull your camera back, um, and zoom in. Use your focal length slider to zoom in on the piece of jewelry. Let's uh, go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that have been asked and I'll see if I can answer some of those for you. All right, uh, so one of the questions is, what's the real-time gamma setting? The real-time gamma setting is essentially it's an image post process. Basically, anything that you um, apply up here in this image setting is, uh, is a post process. So in other words, the image is rendered, and then after it's rendered, if I adjust this brightness or this gamma, it applies it to the image after the fact. Now, um, it, it gets a little complex, and we have uh, webinars that, that cover uh, gamma in more detail. But for proper light fall off, you're going to want to ensure that your real time gamma is set anywhere between 1.8 to 2.2. And you always just want to leave your environment gamma at 1. Unless you're doing some things to um, get a little bit more control over the shadows that are cast in your scene, you're going to want to leave this at 1. Uh, gamma essentially can be thought of as contrast, there is more to it than just that. But as I get this lower value here, look how contrasty things become. And we do certainly lose a bit of detail in the highlight areas and in the shadow areas. Um, now, that, that's one of those things that you could also just take creative freedom on. You know, if you're looking for that sort of uh, you know, look, if you want a very high contrast image, then this is a tool that's available to you at your disposal. But it's important to understand that if you are looking for proper, accurate light fall off, you'll want a value of around 1.8 to 2.2. Okay. Um, the qu next, another question is, is that the default environment? Um, no, this is not uh, the default environment. 
um, but it is a, an environment that does ship with Keyshot. Um, and again, I do suggest for those of you rendering jewelry, um, I would use the studio lighting environments. I, I like this one here. Um, it does have a bit of warm light in it. Um, and you can rotate your environment. So if I press control, left click and drag, that rotates it around. Um, let's take a look at an environment that's not a studio lighting environment and, and see what that gives us. So here's a uh, southern courtyard. And it, it, for jewelry, it's just, it's just kind of strange. You don't, you don't see a whole lot of uh, you know, jewelry photography or renders that are in entirely uh, you know, photo realistic environments. They, um, it, it, just, it doesn't always look, uh, look right. So in most cases, I think you'll find your, your best results by using any one of these uh, studio lighting environments that ship with Keyshot. Okay, um, another question. What's the difference between adjusting the brightness gamma in the real-time tab and doing it in the environment tab? Uh, again, um, this is uh, this, the real-time tab is a post process. Uh, are we having a little problem with the, the viewing the webinar? Can uh, can everyone see the screen? Okay, okay, weird. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to it here. Again, the real-time gamma is a post-process. It's applied to the image after the fact. Now, the nice thing about that is if you are adjusting this, unless you have a backplate, your image doesn't need to be recalculated. So look at this. As I adjust this environment bright brightness, or not the environment brightness, the image brightness, notice that the image is not down resing and recalculating. It's something that you can sort of fine-tune after the fact and uh, not have to wait for the image to recalculate. Now, you notice if I go over to uh, the environment tab and I adjust the gamma there or the brightness here, it does have to recalculate because essentially it's, it's applying it to your environment image that's creating your lighting and then that in turn has to be recalculated. So that's uh, kind of the main difference between the environment and the real-time gamma. Um, another, let's see, another question. Any plans to have caustics in the future? Um, yes, there are certainly plans to have caustics. Um, there was a, a time I remember when we didn't have uh, the translucent material, and the reason was the tr we had it under the hood, but the translucent material was not working off of the HDR environment. Uh, the HDRI did not um, have enough light intensity to be able to calculate the translucent material. So one of the things our developer was able to do is you know, he's actually able to put physical lights in there by you know, going into the code and adding them in. And that's how uh, we initially uh, had a translucent material. Uh, same thing is true with caustics. If we had physical lights in the scene, uh, you would have uh, the, the focused caustics actually occurring. Um, and that's something that, uh, yeah, we are working on uh, for the future. Uh, will using a piece of geometry as a ground plane help define shadows as well? Um, essentially, the shadows are going to be very, very similar. The method that they're calculated is slightly different. Uh, the one um, that calculates it directly onto the ground plane that does not have geometry is faster. Uh, but what you're going to want to do uh, to actually define shadows more um, is you can, under the environment gamma, go in here and actually reduce, uh, drop this down. Let me turn off my uh, ground and direct illumination really quick and I'll increase the shadow quality. So as I start to drop this down, that will actually get a darker, sharper shadow. And you can certainly offset that, um, offset this contrasty look that um, the ring now has by going back to the, um, to the real-time gamma and increasing that. So you still get this dark, sharper shadow, and you sort of bring the detail back in your, uh, in your geometry render. 
So that's one way of going about it. But also it's, it's heavily dependent on the lighting environment that you use. Uh, for example, this environment right here is a sunny day. So if I drag and drop this in, look how sharp our shadow is. So it, it's really heavily dependent. If you have a very bright, um, small light source in your scene, uh, like the sun, for example, it's the brightest light source in the scene, that's going to give you um, a sharp shadow. Okay, um, can I explain IOR a little more? Okay, um, IOR stands for index of refraction, and the uh, basically technical definition of it is how much light slows down as it interacts uh, with an object. Um, the most common example I can think of for that is if you've ever stuck your hand in a pool and it looks like your arm is broken, that's because as light enters the water, it slows down. It's not moving as fast as it does uh, you know, outside of water. Water has an index of refraction of around 1.3, and uh, basically every material in the real world has an index of refraction. So if you go to Google and you type in whatever material it is that you're trying, trying to render, and you type in, you know, say, for example, polypropylene index of refraction, uh, you will be able to find that value. So let's type in polypropylene. And let's see here. Polypropylene is around 1.49. Um, so if you type that into your material parameters, you'll get light bending uh, the same way it does as it interacts with polypropylene. And uh, just as a, as a side note, what it will do is it will increase the reflectivity of uh, materials. Um, so if you are, say, creating a material from scratch using the advanced material, it's important to know that when you get up into metals, metals get an index of refraction of anywhere from like 2 to 3. So if you increase your value that high, you're going to start to simulate metal. So if you're trying to represent a plastic, you're probably going to want to knock that back a bit. Otherwise, you will start to create a metal material. Now, that's purely if you are creating a material from scratch using the advanced material. Uh, if you apply our standard key shot metal, that's already handled for you. So all you really need to worry about is roughness and color and any textures or bump maps that you might like applied. Another question, if you do an offline rendering, will the real-time gamma adjust apply? The answer is yes, it will. Uh, another question, what is the system configuration of the computer you're using? Uh, this particular one, um, it has the, I believe it's the um, Westmere, Westmere processors, uh, Intel and, and uh, Luxion. We work very close together uh, since we are a CPU-based uh, rendering system. And uh, they actually sent us these chips. So in here we have uh, 24 threads. So it's a, it's a quite a beastly computer. But uh, just as a side note, I, I work on a laptop all the time. Uh, we just use these big things for uh, the webinars because it's got to handle audio recording, uh, screen recording, and render key shot all at the same time. So we like to use the uh, beastly computer for that. Uh, do you recommend modifying geometry files so diamonds don't actually touch or intersect uh, the settings, i.e., does clipping edges, stones, gobble up internal reflections and, refl uh, reflections and refractions? Uh, yeah, you won't want your stones uh, intersecting each other. Um, so try and get it as accurate as you can. You don't want um, you know, pieces of geometry uh, intersecting each other. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's going to create sort of a weird look. Um, we do have some more questions, but I, I definitely need to uh, continue on with the webinar so we can cover everything. Uh, we are already running out of time, but as long as it's okay with everyone else, I'll, uh, I'll keep going so that we can uh, continue to learn a little more here, and I'll continue to answer questions um, at the end of the webinar. Because, uh, yeah, there, there are some important things I want to cover in terms of rendering and uh, using 32-bit output. That's going to be really good for you guys to know. So we will uh, come back to the questions here shortly. So let's, uh, let's set up a quick uh, render here. Let's make sure that my settings are, are decent. We did go through and adjust a few things. Gamma is very high here, and that's what gives it this kind of washed out look. So we'll drop that down to around 1.8. I, I do like a little bit more contrast in the render. And I think I'll increase my environment brightness a bit more. And I will uh, 
shadow qualities up. Okay. All right. So um, going back to what we talked about uh, in terms of setting up your camera for jewelry, uh, we do have a long focal length here. So let's do a value of around 300. And let's get a nice, nicely framed shot here. And let's take a look before we render back at ray bounces. Now, remember, we can set this in real time. So I can use this as a gauge to know what I need for my final render settings. Um, and it seems that a value of around 20 is pretty good. Uh, be very efficient when you're, when you're using things like ray bounces. You want to you know, get away with the fewest number possible. And since I've set that here in the real time tab, that lets me know that under the render settings, when I go to quality, I can set that value to 20. And that's going to give me uh, this look right here. All right, so let's talk about 32-bit uh, output. I want to get a environment in here that has a good bit of contrast so that we can sort of see some, some areas that might be a little blown out in the highlights. So let's, uh, let's find one that will do that for us and still give us some decent lighting. Okay, that's, that's not bad. That should work. I'll uh, knock back the brightness just a little bit and let's uh, go ahead and turn off the environment and we'll just render on a white background. Okay, now I will drop back the lighting a little bit. I mean, there are some certainly very hot areas in here. And let's go ahead and render this off. Um, and for this render, I'm going to use something that probably a lot of you have not seen before. Uh, it's not so much this TIFF 32-bit thing, but it is uh, network rendering. Uh, so we'll take advantage of that today. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to TIFF 32-bit, and we'll just do an image of around 1,200 by... 625, and we'll call this ring. Okay. And I'll go over to the network rendering tab, enable network rendering, and we'll fire this thing off. And uh, by the way, network rendering is something that's still under development. I mean, it's, it's in rough form at the moment. Um, it is something that uh, we definitely want to refine more and uh, eventually make it uh, more widely available. So what we're doing now is essentially this should be uh, 48 threads that are taking care of this at the moment because we have a, another AMD machine uh, in the back that's got uh, 24 cores as well. Okay. This is almost done, and then we'll pull this into Photoshop, and I'll show you the benefit of why we would do this in 32 bits. And before we do that, I'll just give you guys a little hint real quick as to why it's important. And I'll do that using one of our HDRI environments. Let's save this view really quick. Bring one. Let's pull in um, an environment here. We'll just look at this southern courtyard very quickly. And I'm going to show the environment. Now the environments are 32 bits. So this uh, should give you a little idea of, of where I'm going with this. I'm going to look up at the environment so we can see what's above us here. Let me brighten it up a bit. Okay. Let's look up above. Let me also reduce the size so you can see what's going on here. Okay, so you see this area that's really blown out up above us here? It looks like there's no detail in here. Well, uh, that's actually not the case. The fact that this is 32-bit means that the whole dynamic range of light is captured in here. So as I darken this down, you can see that all that detail is retained in there. So really, when you see that white blown out area, there's information there that you can access if you want to. So that should give you guys a little hint as to, to why you might want to output an image in 32 bits. So let's go over to Photoshop here, and we'll take a look. Let me 
pause key shot. For those of you who don't know, you press Shift P, that will pause the interface, and the activity will drop off on the cores. Uh, that's great for things exactly like this. If I want to do something in another application, that frees up my system resources. Okay, so here's my 32-bit TIFF file. They will be quite a bit larger in size. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say assign working RGB. Okay, and this pulls up my ring. Now I did render with an alpha channel, so I do have this transparent background here. So I can uh, place different things back there, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, if I go to image, so right here in Photoshop it shows that we are in 32 bits. And I go to adjustments, and I go to HDR toning, this is going to essentially allow us to access those details that might be lost in here. And there are different um, methods that Photoshop has for essentially getting that. So when you pull up the HDR toning uh, interface here, it will show you uh, the different methods. So the easiest one is exposure and gamma. And you guys uh, should be certainly some, somewhat acquaint, acquainted with that from, from using Keyshot. Now, what I can do here is start to drop this exposure and all the detail in the gemstones in those blown out areas is actually still retained. And you can work the gamma, so if you wanted to get more contrast. And what you would want to do with this is essentially, um, if you did have areas where you lost detail and you would like to bring it back, is set up two different, uh, two different images. One that has the exposure dropped and one that has the exposure normal. And you can start to bring back that detail. Let's set it to one, zero, let's see where we're at. So let's take a look at this area here. You see this facet? No detail in there whatsoever. So before I actually do this, I'm going to save this out as a PSD so I can edit it. So I'll just call this ring.psd. And I'm going to open up um, another version of that TIFF file. Okay. So in this one, we have no detail in this facet. Over here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the exposure so that we can bring some of that back. So image, adjustments, HDR toning. And we'll change this from local adaption to exposure and gamma. And we'll start to drop that exposure. See there, now we actually have that detail in that facet. So I'll press OK. And what I'll do is I'll copy this and paste it over the top of here. Uh, now there are different methods for actually uh, isolating areas in Photoshop and uh, selecting this so that you can only overlay, overlay that facet. I'm just going to do a very quick and dirty method just to illustrate the, the concept. And I'll just, in my layers palette, uh, I'll just add a quick layer mask. So right down here, in my very tall layers window, <laughs> is a layer mask button. So if I click this, that applies a layer mask. And now I can paint uh, black and white values uh, to determine areas that are going to be transparent on that particular layer. OK, so here we are in the top layer. The layer underneath it is even as the original image, and as I start to paint uh, black, it's essentially hiding uh, the top layer. So I can increase my brush size, get rid of that, and very quickly we've already successfully brought back a little bit of detail in that area. Now the nice thing about this is if you overdo it and you want to bring that back, I can reduce my brush size by uh, pressing the left bracket key. And if I press X, that toggles between black and white over here in the Photoshop panel. And I can start to bring that area back. And if you zoom in, maybe uh, you don't want the, the diamond to actually be darker, you can bring that back as well by painting white. So that's uh, just a very quick look at why you would want to use 32-bit uh, output. Um, next, uh, I, I want to show you a little bit about masks. 
uh, with Keyshot and, and how those are useful. So let's go back to our uh, scene here and I'll put, um, put that studio environment back in. Now what if, again, say you have a piece of jewelry that has a, a variety of different stones that it can actually come in. You know, maybe it's not, it's the same style ring, but maybe it's offered in amethyst, emerald, ruby. Uh, but you don't want to necessarily re-render the whole image every single time. What you can do is get our old camera view back. Is create masks. So I will save this bit as our ring render. And I'm going to save, oops, save it again as ring render masks. Okay, and I'll pause this one and I'll start a new key shot session and we'll open up the masks file. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn off ground shadows. Uh, we won't need those calculated for the masks portion of this. And I'm going to double click on the ring here and I'm going to change this from metal over to flat and I'm going to give it a color. So this will render with absolutely no shading whatsoever. And I'll copy and paste that from there to another diamond, and then I just double clicked on that diamond, and I'll change it to something that has a nice level of contrast between the green that surrounds it. And I'll paste this around to the other diamonds in the scene. So I'm sure you can see kind of where I'm going with this. Okay, so now if I render this out, I we did 1200 by 625 um, and I'm not going to use network rendering this time I want to show you how uh, the flat uh, material actually renders very fast there's not a lot of calculation involved in that and in this case I, I don't need 32 bits um, and I change it to just the standard TIFF uh, just efficiency and file size you don't need the 32 bits for the mask so I'll render this out and it is ring render masks dot TIFF press render and bam there's our mask Okay, so moving back into Photoshop, let's go in over here and look at our layers. We can open up our ring render masks. And if I select that, and I do edit, paste, oops, let's do edit, paste in place. It places it right there on top. Now the nice thing about that, now I can not only isolate the elements um, on the ring, but I can also isolate the ground shadow, say by selecting uh, this layer. Oh, one thing to note, um, the magic wand tool does not work in Photoshop in 32-bit mode. So now that I've already brought back the detail on the ring that I want, I will be converting it back to 8-bit by going image mode 8 bits and I don't want to merge layers because I want to retain the um, ability to edit these. So we'll select this and if I check this contiguous box it will select all the orange in the scene. And I might have a few stragglers here that I'll just round up the lasso tool and if I press control I, control shift I, that inverts the selection and if I press control J on this background layer, now I have control over that ground shadow. So if I go right this contrast, and hide the uh, ring uh, mask layer, and then here's my shadow layer. If I go image, adjustments, brightness contrast, I can control uh, this a little, uh, I have a lot more control over this. So. Um, so it's nice to, to set yourself up when you are rendering to have this amount of control um, in Photoshop after the fact. So it certainly takes a long time to re-render something, but if you give yourself the tools necessary to control it after the fact, you're going to be um, a lot better off. Okay, so speaking of uh, being able to control things, 
uh, let's change this stone over to say like an aquamarine. So we'll go back to our uh, key shot bib here, not the masks one. And we'll open up uh, ring render. Okay. So let's go ahead and double click on this stone. Well, actually, um, we'll use one of the preset key shot, key shot stones. So double click or click on materials, go over to group, change to gemstones, and I'll drag and drop aquamarine. Okay, so that applied it right there on our gemstone. And instead of rendering the whole image this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a region render. So I'll go over here to region, and this is available in, in the pro version. And if I isolate this area, now I don't have to calculate the ray bounces on all these gemstones back here. I'm only concerned about this particular area. And if you look, I really only have uh, the aquamarine being reflected uh, somewhat in these diamonds, maybe a little bit here. So I'll, I'll just get uh, very close in on this area so that we only have to render a little bit of it. And if we press render, this will now render that area. Okay, so we have that. And again, what I'll do is I'll pause my interface here so I can free up my system resources. We'll go back to Photoshop, and we'll open up that element that we just rendered. See, we did do it in 32 bits, so we still have uh, that level of control. If we wanted to do any sort of uh, bringing back of details or anything like that, we could certainly do so. But I think in this case, I'll just go ahead and leave it as is. And I am going to change it to 8 bits because our other document is 8 bits. Uh, as soon as you do that, you do um, get this option to, hey, how do you want Photoshop to merge all that information? And it's the same uh, interface that we've been working with. And the easiest approach is going to be exposure and gamma. I'll press OK. And I'm going to copy this layer and go back to our other ring here, and I'm going to edit, paste special, and paste in place. Now if I go to my ring here, what I can do is select this gemstone, And what we're going to do is invert that selection by pressing Control shift i And if I delete, oops, okay. So there it is. Um, we do need a little bit more area more of this blue reflecting down in here. So instead of actually using a select tool, I'll use that quick and dirty method that I showed you guys earlier. I'll apply another layer mask by clicking on the layer mask button. Go over here to my brush tool. And all this out here, I'm going to paint black. So if we look at my current color, it is white. I'll press X to switch that to black. And I'm going to increase the size of my brush by, by using the right bracket key. And I'll just get rid of everything. We'll switch it back to white by pressing X. And we'll bring that back. So that's going to probably save uh, quite a bit of time instead of having to render all your images out in whatever stone uh, you, know, you might offer your jewelry in. So that's a, a look at working just a little bit more efficiently. So that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to show you guys today. Uh, 
for the webinar. So I'll go ahead and stick around for a little while and continue to answer questions. And then, so let's see what we got in terms of questions. Okay, uh, one question is, caustics would be very nice. What about subsurface scattering? Uh, actually, we do have subsurface scattering. Uh, so if you are looking for that, um, I can show you uh, very quickly. Let's see if we have a good example. And the subsurface scattering, where that's going to come into play, is uh, it's great for organic things, uh, say like fruits, vegetables, uh, human skin, uh, basically anything organic, really leaves, you name it. But also, uh, some some woods have subtle levels of translucency. Most plastics have some level of translucency. So if you are looking to create a realistic plastic, uh, you might want to look at using the translucent material. So if I double click on this ring. That pulls up the properties. I'll change it from metal over to translucent. And the translucent works off of two colors. Uh, you have your diffuse color, which is going to be the overall color. Let's do something like a orange plastic. And your transmission color, which is the color of light that's actually scattered beneath the surface. Now, what's going to happen here with this is it starts out kind of dark, but as light scatters around beneath the surface of this material, it starts to brighten up. And what we're actually doing is scattering um, this yellow color uh, below that surface. So you will uh, create a soft plastic sort of look. Um, and it will, it will give you a much softer look than you're uh, used to uh, with just using the standard plastic material. Uh, another example of where we've actually used the uh, translucent material is right here. Um, does a great job of uh, rendering uh, skin if that's what you're you're hoping to do. But uh, it, it does, you know, a lot of other things as well. Mostly, I think where you guys will find it to be useful is if you're doing some sort of uh, wood. Or, or plastic material is where you'll want to actually uh, take advantage of that. Uh, certainly anything marble, uh, anything along those lines. Okay. Let's see what our next question is. Okay, we got a lot of questions here, so let me uh, let me scroll up to where I just was. Let's see. Okay. Um, hello, can you apply uh, HDRI reflection to a material? Uh, you can apply HDRI images um, as textures. Hopefully, hopefully that's what you, you meant by that. If not, let me know. Um, ever any plans of doing animation in Keyshot? Oh, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm glad you asked that. I'm currently sitting in the office uh, with our, our developer who is handling that. We are looking to release animation with Keyshot 3. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you uh, an example. We did our first animation last week. Let's see. And I'll go ahead and show that to you. Um, so yes, uh, we are well underway in terms of doing animation inside Keyshot. Uh, this is the first one we actually completed last Friday. Um, I will go ahead and pull up a larger version of that so you can see. And uh, we've really given this animation system a lot of thought. Um, our, our main goal for this was we want simple animation, something that engineers and designers can quickly get in there and show functionality of their products. And we've worked on really making it flexible so that it's easy to make changes to your animation. So as, uh, as this comes further and further along, uh, we'll continue to provide uh, you know, little teasers and, and more information 
about uh, the progress of all this. But it's, it's very exciting to start to see uh, parts and things move inside Keyshot. Uh, so, but the main goal is to make it uh, the same thing we did for rendering we would like to accomplish with animation. So there's uh, your answer to that one. Okay. It would be great if possible creating planes directly in Keyshot. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. That's something we've discussed, too, uh, with version 3, perhaps uh, offering the ability to create simple primitives. Um, John Anderson says, when using a bounce plane, it, when it's not visible, it still shows up in the shadows. Uh, well, you got, you got me there. It is a slight bug that we have at the moment. Um, I believe if you have a texture applied to it, you will still see that shadow. If you don't have a texture applied, try moving the plane, uh, sometimes that gets rid of the shadow. So, so give that a shot. Uh, certainly something that will be addressed with uh, our, our release of version 3. Uh, let's see. Would be great having another rotation axis for environment 2. Um, yeah, that's something we've also discussed. I can't say for certain whether or not we'll put it in Keyshot 3. Um, there are a lot of things on the plate. We may see it, uh, but uh, I can't uh, can't promise you anything. Uh, can this real time adjustment be done to individual object? I'm the guy who tried to get the correct yellow for sapphire, but didn't get it right. <laughs> okay. Yes, I remember you. I, I worked with you. Um, so no, you can't adjust the real time settings per object. Uh, it's purely done as a post process to the overall image, but um, I suggest doing the masks technique that I showed you. That will give you the ultimate control um, in Photoshop after the fact. Uh, a lot of pros out there who you know make their entire business around doing high-end image rendering. Uh, you know the, the render engine gets them you know 90% of the way there, but they certainly give themselves all the passes, all the masks, everything they need to control everything uh, in post using Photoshop. So if you uh, if you are looking for that element of control after the fact, I suggest uh, rendering out those masks. Uh, can your team add some creative HDR studio lighting for us to download? Um, yeah, we do plan on releasing new environments with Keyshot version 3. However, um, if you do go to our site, uh, we do have uh, some available under the download section. So if we go over to downloads and go under environments, uh, these are all available here. Uh, recently, we've been trying to get some more interiors for you guys. We do have quite a few exteriors, and we do realize that a lot of you uh, aren't necessarily automotive folks. Um, you're engineers, you're industrial designers, and you need uh, smaller interior in environments to be able to render uh, your designs in. So check back on this page periodically. All these all are already currently available for you free of charge, and we'll continue to provide more to you uh, free of charge just for um, benefit to being a Keyshot owner. Uh, what are the major differences between 32 and 64-bit? Uh, the main difference comes down to memory. 32-bit um, has a limit on how much memory it can use, uh, a 32-bit operating system that is. So if you are importing large data sets or you're doing very large renders, uh, you're probably going to want to go with a 64-bit machine. Um, the 32-bits, you could end up running out of memory. With a 64-bit, you will not. And again, that's going to come down to importing large data sets and rendering large images. Uh, real life jewelry ends up mushier and wobbly than crisp razor edged CAD files. Any way in KS to apply material that will dull the appearance of edges? Uh, actually, in the render settings, we do have uh, something that's called a pixel filter size. So under the quality tab, this pixel filter size, this applies a slight blur to your overall render. Um, 1.5 is the default. So I mean, that will get rid of those uh, crisp, sharp edges. Uh, and you can go all the way up to 3. And that'll be something that you'll probably want to you know, experiment with to see what you get. But uh, my, my suggestion to you would be is keep it at around 1.5. And then if you find you need to do some additional blurring, I would do it in Photoshop. Uh, because once you render it, that's what you have. You know, you always, and if it's too much, then you might end up having to re-render. So it, it's, again, one of those situations where I feel it's nice to have that control after the fact. 
Is there a way to reset the setting of any specific tab? At the moment, no. Um, perhaps in the future. <laughs> OK, um, just joining. Why the splotchiness in the shadow of the rendering? Uh, what that comes down to is shadow quality. Um, this was set to 1 by default. If I had increased this to a higher value, that would have gotten rid of the splotchiness. Uh, you might also, in that case, want to increase the global illumination quality. But be careful. I wouldn't go much beyond a value of 2 to 3. Uh, it can definitely increase render time. And as you notice, the splotchiness only became apparent after I really cranked the contrast on it. So if you're using the shadow straight out of Keyshot, um, without you know, trying to add brightness to contrast, uh, you might be OK with just the shadow quality of 1. Um, the other nice thing about shadow quality is you can check it in the real-time view, the same way that you can check bounces or your ray bounces. So you can adjust this value in real time. And when your shadow reaches an, an acceptable level of quality that you're happy with, you can use that as a gauge uh, to set it to the same thing uh, in your renders uh, tab. OK, just to make sure I understood, when using HDR lighting and exporting a 32-bit TIFF, will all the reflections from the environment be saved? Uh, the answer is yes. Everything will be saved uh, in terms of lighting and reflections in that 32-bit image. And again, that's the really uh, nice thing about it, is all that information is retained, even if you see uh, that it's blown out in your, in your render. All that information is available to you. And if uh, any of you are familiar with tone mapping, or if you're not, you might want to look into it. It's a very interesting technique here. We'll just pull up an example really quick. Uh, it's for creating dramatic images, and it's based, It's a photography technique, but you can do the same thing in Keyshot. And it produces really dramatic images like this one here. Um, I mean, you see how all the, the detail and everything, nothing is overexposed in this, in this image, and it does produce that really um, dramatic look. And... Uh, it's interesting, I was just about to suggest looking into Photomatics, uh, and sure enough, when I search for tone mapping, the Photomatics page pops up. But it is a piece of software that does tone mapping, and if you output a 32-bit image from Keyshot, you can open that up in Photomatics and apply a lot more interesting tone mapping than what I showed you in Photoshop. So if you're looking for you know, an interesting, edgy, dramatic look, you might look into uh, checking out Photomatics and trying TIFF 32-bit output and doing some experimenting with tone mapping. Is there any workaround to save Z-depth render map to generate depth of field in post-production in Photoshop? Um, at the moment, no. Um, it is something that myself and the other digital media artists in the office are, are pushing for very highly. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a depth pass is, I'll go ahead and show you that real quick. Depth pass. It's, it's, very, it's beautiful actually, to say the least. What it does is when you render out your image, it essentially gives you uh, something like this. It, it's all black and white values, and what this is interpreted as is distance to the camera. So it uses this um, to say, hey, the black is furthest away and white is closest to the camera. And then if you take that and you use a plugin for uh, Photoshop called Frischluft, you can use that depth pass to generate very quick, very nice uh, depth of field. Let's go to Lens Care, and I believe it has some before and after uh, examples on here. See right here, no depth of field and with depth of field. And this is all calculated use it very quick. It's very instant. So, And that's the reason myself and the other uh, digital media artists are really pushing for this, because it will give you an added element of control over a depth of field. Once it's rendered, uh, you can change it. You can change the focus point, and it's extremely fast, and it produces, excuse me, very high quality results. So that's something you can look forward to in the future. Um, I don't think we'll uh, let them get away with not including it. So. Okay, hi there. When I do a rendering with Alpha Channel and Environment, my viewer shows the correct result, but when opening the rendering in Photoshop, the environment is missing. Ah, good question. Okay, I'll show you what's going on there. Uh, this is the way that Photoshop CS5 handles alpha channels and transparencies. It's kind of weird. I'm, I'm used to it um, not behaving this way. And I'll show you what you can do to bring back your environment. Okay. So if we go to... Let's see. Let's see. 
of these should have an alpha. No. Okay, let me quickly output one that has an alpha. And I'll show you exactly why that occurs and how you can get your alpha channel back. So here's our, uh, let's get our environment in view. So there's our environment. Let's go to the render menu. Go to TIFF, include alpha, I'll turn on network rendering, and let's render. Oops. I had a region rendering enabled. Let me turn that off. And let's do this again. And while that renders, the next question sure would be nice if KS would render to a layered PSD for that sort of workflow with shadows and shader groups already masked and uh, busted out. Uh, absolutely, I completely agree with you. Um, a lot of rendering applications have things of like render passes where it already will separate your shadows, your reflections, uh, your refractions, everything like that. And that's uh, something as well that, I, that I'll certainly be uh, pushing for including in, in later versions. Um, and that would be incredibly useful. So let's, uh, let's open up that render that we just got. And as you can see, as the person mentioned in their question, there is no background here. Where did our environment go? If you go to uh, Layer, Layer Mask, and then you do From Transparency, I have my alpha channel now. And if I delete this Layer Mask over here, let's see. Okay, so here's your alpha channel. If I delete this Layer Mask, there's my environment. I have it back. So that's how you go about getting your environment back if you render with an alpha. And that's, uh, that's a Photoshop thing. That's how Photoshop uh, handles alphas now. Uh, let's see. Follow-up last question on splotchiness. For sake of time, I had to do five-minute real-time renders, which are noisy, especially shadow areas on glossy light colors. Do you have a Photoshop recommendation for fast cleanup of splotchy shadows and noisy shadow areas? Um, I mean, it, it would be a very manual process. You would essentially have to go in there, I would imagine, with a small size blur tool and start blurring uh, those splotchy areas uh, by hand. Uh, it would be a bit tedious, but I can show you something about ground shadows. Um, that is definitely good to know that can save you a bit of render time. Um, this will only work if you are rendering on the ground plane. If your ground shadows are cast across geometry, this will not apply. Um, so let me drop my shadow quality all the way down to one. And the reason I mentioned earlier that the calculation of the, the shadow on the ground plane is a different method than shadows cast across geometry and that it's faster. And basically, you can think of the ground plane as being divided up as a bunch of uh, grid squares. So I'm going to increase my ground, ground size to sort of show you what I mean by that. If You've probably all seen this at some point when you look at your shadow, and it looks kind of blocky. Now, this ground plane that we have inside Keyshot is divided up into a whole bunch of little grid squares. And each one of those grid, grid squares has some color and shading information about the uh, density of that shadow. Okay, Now if you have a very very large ground plane and it has say 64 divisions in it, those 64 divisions are quite a bit bigger. So you have a large square that has color information about the shadow. If I reduce the size of this ground plane, now I have a much smaller ground plane that has the same amount of divisions in it, but they're a lot more tightly densely packed in. So I, I get a better uh, looking shadow. And let me reduce this down really low so you can see. You can see this clipping here. This is our actual ground plane that the shadows are being uh, calculated on. If I increase this, um, you know, it does expand the size of that ground plane. But the little squares, the grid squares that make up this ground plane do get larger. Um, when you actually increase the shadow quality, what that's doing is adding more grid squares. You're dividing it up even more. So one thing you can do to try and get better uh, shadow quality without uh, necessarily increasing the shadow quality setting is go to your environment 
and reduce your ground size. Try and get it down to something as small as you can without seeing this uh, clipping occurring. Uh, it says you applied a material to the ground earlier. Can I show that again? Um, I did do that, but I also had a ground plane in there. So let me turn off the field in this scene here. Um, it's just an, another piece of geometry in the scene. And the nice thing about it is um, when you do have that under there, you can uh, apply different types of uh, materials like frosted glass or uh, metals, things of that nature. And when you do that, you do get a lot more control over um, the look of your ground reflections. So in this particular material, I do have a bump map applied. Um, and if I reduce the scale of that, uh, this could probably end up looking a bit better. And if I reduce the height of the bump map to give it something a little more subtle, I can probably create a decent uh, brushed metal uh, style look on that. So that's uh, how I ended up applying a material to the ground plane. Okay. Can you hide the shadow created by a bounce plane? Uh, yeah, um, you will want to, it's, it's a small bug in Keyshot at the moment, you'll want to just right click on that hidden plane, select move object, and just move it slightly, and the shadow will update. Um, if you do have a texture applied, I do believe it will actually still stay, and that's something that we will certainly fix uh, for version 3. Uh, is the animation part of Keyshot 3, or do we have to purchase? Uh, it will be an additional add-on. Um, I don't know uh, what it will be in terms of pricing. Um, that's that's something uh, we're still, uh, you know, resolving and, and figuring out. Uh, right now, we're we're mostly just focused on uh, making it a good tool and making sure that it's complete and ready to rock by the time it gets to you guys. And uh, me, I, I work on the development side of things and advising and whatnot. So I'm not really the uh, the salesperson, but. If you do have questions about that, I suggest contacting sales at lexion.com and they'll probably be able to provide you a bit more information on that. Uh, when will V3 be out? Uh, we're looking, uh, hoping to release uh, September timeframe. So that's, that's our goal and uh, it should be, should be very nice. I think uh, we've put a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of thought into this next version. So we are uh, certainly excited about what's uh, what's all going on on the development side. Speaking of HDR environments, do you want recommendations for types of environments we'd like? Maybe a topic for the forum? Absolutely. Any suggestions you guys have in terms of, hey, webinars you'd like to see, HDRIs you'd like to see, materials you'd like to see? I mean, all this stuff we do, we do for you guys. So, you know, if you have any suggestions for things like that, please. You know, fire away, let us know. You can let us know at support at Luxion.com or you can, um, you know, certainly make some posts on the forum and say, hey, it would be great to have this and, you know, we'll certainly take all that into account because we want you guys, at the end of the day, I mean, we want to make your jobs as designers and engineers and photographers uh, that much easier. Uh, difference between Keyshot Normal and Keyshot Pro. Uh, the main differences are you're going to have turntable rendering in Pro, you're going to have a render queue, you're going to have region rendering, uh, you are going to have uh, turntable animation, and you have unlimited render resolution. And that's uh, the main difference between Keyshot and Keyshot Pro. It would be very appreciated seeing more very simple, efficient studio environments on the download page. Okay, um, that's something we can certainly look into. Uh, work on getting you guys some more studios. Are materials available for download anywhere? Um, at the moment, no, we don't have that. Uh, what we are, we have been discussing and looking into is we would we would like to do a material share site in the future, where um, you know essentially we can have a community where users can get together uh, and share materials. Uh, if you do have questions about creating specific materials or certain looks, you know please uh, feel free to email us at support at luxion.com. You know we're here to help you. Uh, help you do that and we're happy to do so. Okay. Any chance of adding spherical output in KS? Uh, I imagine you're saying uh, create a spherical HDRI uh, based on what's in our key shot scene. Um, at the moment there there aren't any plans for that. Uh, 
there's there's a lot of other things that we would like to to get integrated into Keyshot, um, and that's that's I'll be honest with you, that's not high on the priority list. Maybe something we'll see in the future, but at the moment it's not really on the uh, radar screen. And can we uh, post webinars in MPEG-4 formats? Certainly. Um, yeah, I believe we do have some already posted under our webinars page that you should be able to view on your iPhone. Um, but yeah, we, we are, uh, you know, we do like to make sure that people can view uh, the webinars and any videos that we post on their mobile devices as well. So, all right, I think that about wraps it up for the questions. And we did go a little bit over today, only 45 minutes. <laughs> You know, hopefully that was useful for all of you, um, and uh, you know, I hope to see you again for our next webinar. And if you do have any questions uh, about anything that was covered today, you can either email myself, uh, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at Luxion.com, or you can send an email to support uh, at Luxion.com. And also, like I mentioned, if you have any suggestions for future webinars, uh, please let us know, and we'd, we'd love to, uh, you know, cover any topic that you would like explained. So, all right, guys, uh, enjoy the rest of your day or night, depending on what part of the world you're tuning in from, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming.